Many of you know what it feels like to be in the presence of God. Amen. 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 There's nothing like being in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Can we give our God a praise? Can we give our God a worship? Can, can we call down heaven this morning? Amen. Amen. Can you just quickly just think about the goodness of Jesus? Can you quickly just think about what it, what it would have been if it wasn't for the Lord? If it wasn't for Jesus on your side? If it wasn't for his grace? If it wasn't for his mercy? Where would you be? Where would I be if it wasn't for the Lord's hand? If it wasn't for his mercy? If it wasn't for his provision? If it wasn't for his protection? Hallelujah! Where would we be? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Take 30 seconds just to reflect about how good God has kept you from January all the way up into November. He's put food in your belly. He's put clothes on your back. He's provided your bills. Hallelujah! We serve a good God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. There's something about being in the presence of God. When you're in the presence of God, you don't look at the things of this world. You, you don't focus your mind on what's not working. All you see is the glory. Hallelujah. All I see is the glory. All I see is your adoration. All I see is your handprint. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all I want to do is to see your glory. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I didn't think I had a voice today, but something about standing behind this desk. I feel my help. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Do I have a thankful church? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God has been amazing. He's been wonderful. He's been faithful. And we owe God a praise. We owe, we owe him a praise. Amen. Amen. It could have been another way. It should have been another way. There were some bullets that was attached to us. There were some, some graves that were attached to us. Your mama could have been dead. But, but look at God. Look at God. Look at God. Look at God. He is a miracle worker. Hallelujah. It could have been another way. But God said there's another chance. God said there's another opportunity. Give God a praise. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. It really don't take much for you to give God the glory. When you just think about the simple things that blood is running warm in your veins, that you have breath in your body, there's really a lot of things that we can give God the praise for. When you think about that you walked in here with your own strength, hallelujah, you are in your right mind, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you don't have nothing else to say, 
Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Confuse the enemy. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes I can't contain myself when I think about the goodness of Jesus. When I think about how he's kept me all these years after you lost your loved ones, after you've been through hell, but look at you. You're still here. It could have been another way, but God saved you. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yeah, 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 yeah! No rocks will cry out for me. Nothing will give God the praise because you know your story. You know your testimony. He healed you from cancer. He kept you when you lost your job. When you lost your husband. When you lost your father. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. You buried your son. But you're still in your right mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Yeah! Hallelujah! That's what he wants. He wants your worship. Hallelujah. We came to give God the praise. Amen. We didn't drive all this way just to sit here and look cute. But we came to serve. We came to worship. We came to praise. We came to serve. We came to give. What did you come here to do? I came here to praise. I came here to worship. I came to give God the glory. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't know what this moment is doing. You don't know how this moment is keeping your mind. You don't know how sacred this moment is. This moment is going to keep you on tomorrow. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I came to give God something on today. I didn't come to look cute. I didn't come to sit down. But I came to give God my all. I came to give God my mind, my body, and my soul. Hallelujah. Let the instruments play. Let the voices cry out. Let testimonies go forth. Give God the praise. Hallelujah. 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 We give God the praise for all of his goodness, all of his mercy, all of his miracles. We give God the praise, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you the glory, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've been too good to us, God. God, we don't deserve what we have. We don't deserve the favor that you've given us. We don't deserve it, God. We've sinned. We've blundered. We've, we've dropped the ball. Yet you still love us. Yet you still opened up doors for us. Yet you've still healed our bodies. Yet you continue to give us your blessings and your mercy and your forgiveness and your favor, God. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. I'm glad you got to shout out early because God wants to teach this lesson on today. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 through 9, and it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, he shall take my offering. Verse 3 says, And this is the offering which ye shall take of them gold, silver, brass, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skin, shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the epit and in the breastplate. Our key verse for today, it says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all instruments thereof, even shall ye make it. Amen. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, let it be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Anoint my mind, anoint my mouth, anoint my message in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. For a subject, for a theme, for a topic, just look to your neighbor and let him know that even in the wilderness, God expects worship. Amen. Amen. On your way to your seat, just lift it up in the atmosphere and just say wilderness worship. Wilderness worship. <clears throat> wilderness worship. Can, can you still give God worship even in, even in the wilderness? As, as we have all been given the mandate to continue moving forward towards that which God has called us to, one one of the things that we must both maintain and manage is the matters of the heart. Taking care of what is considered to be the center and the very core in which all Christianity lies. It's, it's the heart. It's the heart. We have to take care of our heart. It's interesting <clears throat> because many statistics show that on average, the number of cardiac surgeries in the United States exceeds over 900,000 procedures each year. That's a large number. <clears throat> Cardiovascular surgery, also referred to as cardiac surgery or heart surgery, describes any surgical procedure that involves the heart. It involves the blood vessels that carry blood to and from the heart. These procedures are common with patients who have heart disease or have had a heart attack, have had a stroke or blood clot, as well as individuals who are at high risk for developing these problems. While cardiovascular surgery isn't always necessary to treat heart problems, doctors may at times recommend it for a variety of reasons, including treating or preventing heart attacks, blood clots, addressing irregular heartbeats, opening blocked or narrowed arteries, repairing congenital heart problems, and fixing damaged or uh, diseased heart valves. 
it's important to get this because just as frequent and necessary surgical procedures are for the heart in the natural, so it is even the more necessary for there to be a procedural heart change in the spirit. Resurrection, I am afraid to know the spiritual statistics on the status of the believer's heart. I'm afraid of the details and the findings in which the MRI exam will reveal and report as it relates to the very conditions of uh, our hearts. It's important to get this because Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 cautions us to keep and to guard our hearts because out of the heart it says that it flows the issues of life. That's the first question that I really want to ask us on this morning and that is what's flowing out of your heart? What's What's flowing out of your heart? Is it that which represents the consequences of that which is carnal or the sustaining power that comes by way of the spirit? It's, it's important to get this because if the enemy can't destroy what God has intended for you, then he'll do everything possible to cause you to waver in the faith in your decision and your confidence to remain steadfast. If, if he can't stop what God has declared and decreed and spoken over your life, then he'll do everything possible in order for you to doubt in what it is that God has in store for your destiny. Three, three areas that we must pay attention to, three areas that we must either avoid or associate ourselves to in order to maintain both the atmosphere of God and the anointing of God is to put to death all anxiety and worry. We, we have to put to death worry, being found then always with a mind to work. We have to have a mind to work while having a true heart for worship. Three things again to watch as it relates to your walk with God, putting to death worry, having the mind to work, and having a heart for worship. It's important to get this because one of what the enemy has oftentimes used to distort both our faith and our focus in this season is the spirit of worry. Worry being, beloved, a sense of uneasiness or anxiety about not only the needs of this present time, but the needs in the provision that will have to take place in the future. Worry is a mental state in which there is a soulish torment. It's, it's a torment of the soul. This is what it is defined as what worry is. It's a soulish torment or anxiety regarding anything in life. It is a disquieting, it's a painful state of mind involving great concern over only the cares of this world. Worry often anticipates the worst. You, you, you always anticipate the worst. It, it anticipates the worst where as a result you are now apprehensive. You, you are stuck. You are paralyzed. You, you are afraid to move forward because you anticipate danger. You anticipate misfortune. You, you anticipate trouble or uncertainty. Worry is a state of restlessness. It's, it's an agitation of the spirit producing mental disturbance, mental uneasiness, foreboding, anxiety. Um, it, according to scripture, at the heart of worry, it is an intense struggle to rest upon the provision and the power of God in the midst of a broken and unstable world. As, as believers, we are to live with godly concern, which is dependent upon God and rooted in prayer. This is, this is what we need to have as believers. We need to be rooted in the word of God, but we also have to be rooted in prayer, depending on God. Scripture indicates that such anxiety is ultimately grounded in a lack of trust uh, in God and a lack of trust in his purpose. The causes of worry oftentimes include being worldly centered in thought. This is, this is the root cause of worry is when you are worldly centered in thought. In other words, this is the person who is consumed only with the cares of this world. 
Instead of being consumed with the kingdom, instead of being consumed in thought and mind, in action with the gospel, with what God has called and commissioned us to, we consume ourselves with the cares of the world, consumed with bills, consumed with your rent, consumed with your mortgage, how, how they're going to be paid, consumed with the daily necessities of life, food, shelter, uh, consumed with the nuances in the trends of this world, what this world presents instead of trusting and relying in God's word. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 and verse 34 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat in the body than raiment? Uh, verse 34 says, take therefore no thought for the morrow. Uh, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Number two, worry reveals the lack of confidence in God. It's, it's the stance and the belief that God won't deliver on the promises of his word. It's the belief that since God won't do it, I'll do it by myself by any means necessary. Lack of confidence in God not only reveals lack of trust in God's word, but even the more the lack of trust in the character in the nature of God. John chapter 14 verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. First, First Peter chapter 5 verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Lady, Lady Hoda says it's one thing to believe in God, but there's another, there's a whole nother thing to trust in him. Do, do you trust him with your life? Do you trust him to take care of your provision? Do you trust God to take care of what it is uh, that you need? Number three, when we worry, the action and the result of worry will soon cause you to abandon God. Because worry always will lead you in the opposite direction of the presence of God. Matthew chapter 13 Verse 22 says that he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. We're talking about this in Bible study. It, 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 is, it is he that heareth the word in the care of this world in the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and then he or she becomes then unfruitful. It's important to get this because the Greek word for worry is merimano, which means to separate or to divide or to draw different directions, which is exactly what worry does, what exactly what anxiety does to us. From the origin of uh, what we see based off of Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, describes then the state of being pulled apart. When, when you worry, you are being stripped. You are being ripped apart from the presence of God. Thus, when circumstances are difficult, when trials and tribulations come, when the storms of life come, it is then easy to let oneself be dominated by anxiety or dominated by worry. It's important to get this because when we worry, instead of remaining close to God, we then, as a result, will run away, will stray away, will hide like Gideon, will we'll, 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 we'll hide from the calling and the assignment that God has called in purpose for us to do. This is why our hearts must be conditioned, but then it also must be connected unto God. You, you have to condition your heart. You, you have to be connected to, to God because a heart that's committed unto God will always find itself in spite of the circumstances 
of life being still yet able to overcome. This is this is this is why you are still here. This is why your your situation didn't stop you. This is why you didn't throw in a towel because not only were you committed, not only did you have a conditioned heart, not only were you connected, but but you were able to overcome by by the word of God that has been hid in uh, your heart. We we see this great need to overcome the carnal affections of our heart because the children of Israel in our text are wandering in the wilderness. They're, they're wandering in the wilderness. They, they've seen and they've witnessed the mighty hand of God. They, they've experienced firsthand the provisions of God, yet they are inwardly struggling with giving their whole heart unto God. It, 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 it's it's a, a, a lot of times you're seeing a lot of masks in the church. You're, you're seeing a lot of people who celebrate Halloween 365 days out of the year. They, 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 they're, they're outwardly saying one thing. They're, they're outwardly displaying one thing. They're, they're outwardly acting as one thing, but they're inwardly struggling with giving their whole heart unto God. God has brought them out of bondage. He's fought their battles. He's made ways out of no ways, yet the way that God has chosen to reveal himself unto them has caused them to still yet seek other gods. We, we have to be careful in picking and choosing how we want God to show up. God, God, I only want you for your miracles. God, I only want you for your hand. Uh, but we have to be careful in how God chooses uh, to show up. Amen. Uh, it's, it's important to get this uh, because it, it's strange that after all that God has done for us, our allegiance at times is still attracted and pulled towards the things of this world. After after all of God has done, after he's kept you, after he's sustained you, after he's provided for you, we are still, by nature, easily lowered to the things of this world. It's important to get this because when our attention is off of the goodness of God, not only will we complain with anxiety, not only will we complain in worry, but we'll lose our heart to work. We'll, we'll lose our heart to worship. It's, it's important to get this because when we look at the wilderness and what the wilderness represents, we'll see that its purpose is to free you from the grips of sin. We'll, the wilderness is to free you from bondage that you can then be transformed into the person that God has called you and I to be. Everything that has happened to you in this season will always point back to the spirit. It will always point back to the work of sanctification. In other words, you thought that the decrease in the hold in the cap on your finances was a result of punishment, but it ended up really showing you the provision of God. You you thought that the job, you thought that your boss, you thought that your nasty co-workers were just getting on your nerves, but that agitation was really developing in you the fruit of the spirit. You, you thought that your marriage was estranged. You thought that your marriage was over. You thought that your marriage, you thought that that relationship had no purpose but somehow that marriage has kept you on your knees in prayer and supplication it's it's important to get this because although the this is a place of isolation and separation the wilderness is also a place of preparation and it's also a place of revelation preparation for what God has in store for you to receive, but it's also revelation to show you what God has required. It, 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 it is, it, the wilderness it, it is a place of receiving, but it's also a place to reveal to you what God has required. In other words, what is God speaking to you in this season? 
What has God required from you out of uh, your life? We, we see that here because when we look at the text, it says that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. It's important to get this because for some reason, many of us still struggle with the tug of war between willingly giving and then giving grudgingly. A giver who gives grudgingly is defined as a person who is unwilling in the spirit, uneasy or reluctant to give. To give grudgingly or not at all is a sign of of a heart issue, that, that we value money more than we value our relationship with Christ, that we value comfort more than we value our relationship with Christ. When we give grudgingly, it's a sign that we value security more than the kingdom of God. It is only when we learn to give from the place, from the foundation of grace where we will then see the fulfillment of our sacrifice. What are you willing to give Christ? What, what are you willing to give unto God? Because after all, Christ did die for us. After, after all, he did endure the penalty of sin. After all, he did endure the thorns that were pressed on his head. After all, he did endure nails that were driven in his hands and in his feet. Lord, then this, it really should be an easy to give God the praise. Lord, and Lord, when you think about all that the Lord has done for you, it should really propel us to say, Lord, I freely give you my time. Lord, Lord, I give you my talents. Lord, I give you my treasure because you've been too good to me. This is this is really why I praise you. This is this is really why I worship you because if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, if it if it had not been for the Lord who has made ways out of no ways, just do me a favor real quick in my teaching sermon and just let them know where would I where would I be? He says, speak unto the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. He says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle in the pattern of all the instruments thereof, and so shall ye make it. So, so, we, so we talked about tearing down today in Sunday school, and Lady Hoda said that sometimes we have to tear down first before we can build up. And so this lesson today is teaching us what God wants us to build. But if our hearts aren't conditioned, if our hearts is consumed with worry, it won't cause us to then be in the mindset to work. It's, it's important to get this because what I'm learning more and more is that in spite of the difficulties of life, in spite of the many discouragements, in spite of our wilderness experience, God still requires each and last every each and last every one of us to work. He causes and he does and he requires us to work. It's interesting because one of the many questions that we often ask ourselves is what does God want with us? What does God want with me? This is this is one of the questions that we oftentimes ask us, and it's one of the most important questions that we'll ever answer. However, we at many times get the answer wrong because we completely at times misunderstand what God wants from us. Most of us have either one or four postures with God, life from God. Life from God. Life from God is wanting God's blessings and his gifts, but not God himself. Using God to get our desires focuses on um, our consuming. This is worshiping God for what he can give us. If, if we obey him, 
we hope he'll give us the good life. We, we have a relationship with God because we want him to bless us. This is, this is one, of the four, one of the four postures that many of us see. Uh, not only is it life from God, but life over God. Life over God. Life over God is abandoning God in favor of proving formulas in controllable outcomes. It's, it's the implementation of useful principles, focuses on managing. This is the thinking that we can get some control over God, but how we live. How we, we think we need a relationship with God, but let's face it, we, we have to dig down deep and make sure that we create the kind of life we want for ourselves because nobody's going to do it for us. So not only is there life from God, not only is there life over God, but there's life for God. Focusing on accomplishing great things for God, a task to accomplish and focus on serving. We think that we will lay down our lives sacrificially and do something for God that really matters. We want a relationship with God so that we can do something for him. Life under God is relating to God according to cause and effects. We obey and God blesses. A set of rules and rituals to follow focuses on sin. We want a relationship with God because when we obey him, he'll give us what we need. So it's important to look at our relationship with God and ask ourselves, are you here today because you want something from God? Are you here today because you're looking for a set of principles that you can follow that will lead to your life being in a success? Are you here today because you want to give your life in service unto God? What, are, what, what is the purpose of, of your coming today? So according to the book of Exodus, all of these approaches um, at times can fall short to God. Why? Because none of them really captures the magnitude of what God wants with us. What, what does God want with us? He says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Exodus chapter 29 verses 45 through 46 says, I will dwell among the people of Israel and I will be their God and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them I am the Lord their God it's important to get this because God's primary purpose for us isn't to give us things to or to be managed or for you to live your life under him. Uh, but God's primary purpose is to live with us, to, to dwell with us uh, so that he could dwell among us to be our God. And this is the very thing that sets us apart from everyone else. Moses says in chapter 33, is, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? Um, and so God's presence is what sets us apart. It, it's, it's what sets us apart from everyone else. So looking back, the children of Israel's primary problem when in Egypt was not slavery. This is, this is interesting. Their primary problem was not slavery, although it was significant. Their main problem was that God was not with them. Their main problem was that they were separated from God. God, in other words, God wants to dwell with his people and he'll do whatever it takes to bring you into right relationship with him. But we have to have a heart of worship. We have to have a heart where God can dwell. It, it's, it's important to get this because the Greek word for dwell is shakan, which means to settle. It, it is to settle down, to rest. It means to occupy. And, and that's really all that I came here to tell you, to preach you, to teach you to the place of your understanding, to know that it's really all about your heart. It's, it's all about the matters of your heart, that, that when your heart is in the right condition, the glory in the presence of God, will settle here that that when you worship from a pure heart from a pure place the glory in the presence of God will settle to the point where you see the manifestation
manifestation of God, that you'll see his miracles, you'll, you'll see his signs, you'll see his wonders, you'll, you'll see his favor, you'll see his provision. How, how have you made God welcome into your hearts? Can, 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 can he do what he wants to do in your life? Because at the end of the day, what I'm learning is that what God really wants is a yes. He all, all he's seeking is a yes because when we look at the text again, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I will show you. After the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. In other words, God is looking for a heart that's committed unto him. Can, in other words, can you give God a yes without knowing the details? Can you give God a yes in your life without knowing the facts, without knowing the blueprint, without knowing the end result? Can, can you give God a yes simply because of his track record, simply because of what he's already done, simply because of his word? Can, can you give God a yes in this season, even though you see water to your left, even the water is on your right? Even though Pharaoh is chasing you from the back, even though water's in the front, can you give God a yes in this season? Even when you don't know, even when you can't see it, even when you don't understand, can you give God a yes? God is looking for a yes. God is looking for a yes, even in the wilderness. Even in your dry moments, even when it seems as if your finances are running dry, even when your relationships are running dry, even when it looks like everything around you is running dry, God still requires you to worship him in the wilderness. He says, everyone that has a heart to give, bring the offerings unto me. Notice that he's talking to former slaves. He's talking to slaves who were recently uh, 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 delivered from bondage, but yet he requires them uh, to, to give gold. He, he says, he says, he says, take up an offering and I want gold. I want silver. I want brass. I, I want purple. I want blue. I want scarlet. I want fine linen. I want goat's hair. I want dyed skin ram. I want all of these different things. He's talking to slaves that did not have a job. What are you giving unto God? In other words, God requires an expensive worship. God requires something of you that costs. God, God requires something of you that is expensive. He's, he's sick and tired of cheap worship. He's sick and tired of thrift me down worship. He's, he's sick and tired of pass me down worship. But where is your gold? Where, where is your brass? Where, where is it? He says, even in the wilderness, I still expect my tithes and my offering. I still expect what I want. God is a God of order. Yes, we are free to worship, but we are to freely worship him according to his dictates. He says, bring me an offering so that you then can make me a sanctuary. We're bringing God our mess. We're bringing God our baggage. We're bringing God everything else but giving him the worship. Yes, we are to cast our cares upon him. Yes, yes, God wants it all, but he still requires worship. 
And so in this season, we have to make sure that our hearts are in the right condition so that he can dwell among us. When, when God dwells, we, we have every access. When, when God dwells, we have the Shekinah glory. When, when God dwells, we have provision. We, we have protection. We have everything that we need. But it's going to require a heart that is not consumed in worry, but a heart that's willing to work a heart that's willing to worship that's what God wants to speak to us on today lose the worry get back to the work get get back to you rolling up your sleeves we're all standing get back to the place of your work get back to the place of your worship so that we we so that way we can continue to build what God wants are we focused on the building up of the kingdom are we focused on the building up of the gospel? Are, are we focused on the things of, of the spirit? Or are we only consumed with building up our own name? Consumed with building up our own legacy? But what are we building for God? Even on the mountaintop, but even the more, even in the valley, God still requires worship. He still requires what he has poured into us to give it back unto him. Amen. Amen. This is what God wants on this morning. Wilderness worship. How is your heart? Has your heart been tainted because of the trials of this world? Has your heart been discouraged because of the no's right now? Has your heart been tainted? But you can come back to him. You can come back with a grateful heart. You can come back with a worshipful heart. You can come back and give God what he desires. Check your heart. Check your motives. Because God is requiring something out of us. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.